In you, O oh God, is the fountain of life. In your life, we shall see life. Your life is not according to this world. The patterns of your life is not now determined by the patterns of the world. The pattern of your life now is determined by the realities which are in Christ Jesus. And so, you live and you stand by those realities and nothing else. You see, you function by the realities which is in Christ. Your commitment is to the gospel. Your commitment is to Christ. Your commitment, first of all, is not to your business. It is, first of all, to God. It's to Christ. The church was so much locked up in that love of God. It was so strong to the extent that, you know what? They just had to go to the upper room to spend time there together in fellowship. And we have about 120 people. They were locked up in the upper room in fellowship. Not, not for anything, for fellowship. It's a tiny year. Now, they were not waiting for the Holy Ghost to come for them to receive power for their businesses to grow. Or for them to find loved ones, someone to love them. Or to find some new job opportunities. That wasn't the reason they tarried. They tarried. More because they they knew there is something more important they have to experience. Which is getting deeper, growing deeper in God. Growing deeper in the knowledge of Christ. Becoming the very effulgence of God's glory. Becoming the very expression of God unto the world. The essence of our living is one thing. That Christ will be magnified in our body. That Christ will be magnified in our body. And I explained to you when we're looking at the book of Philippians, and I said that when we say Christ to be magnified, we are speaking of it in two dimensions. And I said, Christ is what a telescope. Like, you know, we, we are like a telescope. And I said, what do we do? Many people think that God is, a, is far away. Many people think that Christ is far away. But when they look into us, they realize that he's closer than ever. There are some that think that Christ is too small for them. And we serve as microscope unto them. That when they look into us, they see the greatness of Christ. This is the joy of our life. Nothing about you. So you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. So what are the things informing your decisions about this new birth, about being born again? Beloved, it's in God's wisdom that we all become the members of his body. It is the wisdom of God. It is the wisdom of God. Let's look at our anchor scripture again. The scripture we are using for our discussion. Let's read 1 Corinthians, the chapter number 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and sustains our brother. To the church of God, which is at Corinth. Number one, you need to understand that I was explaining to you the last time. I said the church is the body of Christ. And I said the body of Christ is mystical. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll look at that very soon briefly. Chapter 12, I think from verse 12, it speaks of we all being baptized by one spirit into one body. All right? We are all baptized into one body and we are all being made members of that same body. 
So when you become born again, I explain that you don't just receive the life of God. You become, you see, when you receive the life of God in you, the life of God makes you become something. And what do you become? Yeah. So when you become born again, you don't just receive the life of God. When you receive the life of God, you become something else. You become a son of God. So he says, now are we the sons of God. Now, as sons of God, he says, we are also in Christ. We are in Christ. We're in Christ. Practically, we are in Christ's body. Essentially. When you become born again, you find yourself in Christ's body. It is spiritual body. Christ's body is spiritual. And as new creations, we are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He said, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So when you become born again, you are a new creation. And you are in Christ Jesus. You are in him. So to be in Christ is also to be in his body. To be in the very body of Christ. That body of Christ is a spiritual body. Because listen, the Christ in whom you, be, you, you became part of is spiritual. And how did it become spiritual? In incarnation, Christ came in the flesh. In a physical body. He was born. But that body carried the divine life. He carried the divine life. He, he is the word of God made flesh. That is Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh. He lived as God on earth. When we read in the book of John, I say that he is the amalgamation of divinity and humanity. God and man mingled together in Christ. And I have explained that when you become born again, you become the spot where God and man mingles together. Because he says, now you are the temple of God. Are you sure you are here? All right. Now, when Jesus went to the cross and he died, and his body was broken, and he was buried, the Bible says he was, he, he, he was raised from the dead. When Jesus was raised, he became a life-giving spirit. I will see in the scriptures how Jesus entered the room where the brethren met. And the door was not open. The door was locked. Yet Jesus entered. That is the pneumatic Christ. Because now, this Christ, who was incarnated, now became the intensified Christ. And in this intensified Christ, we all were healed. He became the pneumatic Christ. If you say pneumatic, if you say pneuma, the word pneuma is spirit. So he became a spirit being as he has always been with you. Practically, his physical body has metamorphosed. Now he's, he, he, the first Adam was a living soul, the Bible says, but the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. So now, he became a life-giving spirit. That as you come in contact with him, he dispenses life into you. So now, as a pneumatic Christ, We all now can be baptized into him. Look at something. Katanaba Shandele Lebrosh. Indoko Sandaba. Let me read second Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 13 to you. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. 
Because the veil is taken away in Christ. So every veil which has to do with the law is only taken away in Christ. Not outside Christ. Only in Christ. So he said the veil is taken away in Christ. Meaning the moment you come into Christ and you look in Christ, there is no veil. With an open face, you behold. Hey, hallelujah. Can you shout this better? I behold. behold. Verse 15. But even to this day, when Moses is read, oh, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one thanks to the Lord, now follow. When one thanks to the Lord, who is the Lord? Christ Jesus. He is the Lord. Are you sure you are here? So he said, when one thanks to the Lord, what happens? The veil is what? Taken away. Just as I said to the Hebrews. He said, looking unto Jesus. And I explained to look unto Jesus means to look away. Looking unto Jesus. It means to look away. From all the noise, the legalisms, the efforts of, of men, look away and look unto Jesus. Because when you see Jesus, there is no veil. There is no veil. There is no blindfolding. You behold God in his wholeness. He said the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus. Are you sure you are here? Alright, so the moment you turn to Jesus, he said the veil is removed. You see beyond religion. You participate in a real fellowship. I show you are following. Alright, so see this. Nevertheless, when one thanks to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Hey! Now, not tomorrow. He said, now. He said, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. So he said, now the Lord is the spirit. So if you are talking about the spirit, the spirit is also the Lord. That's why I said, when you become born again, you are not, you don't first receive Jesus. Then you wait and then you try hard and you receive the Holy Ghost. Then you work harder, harder in faith. Then you receive the Lord or you receive the Father. No, the Bible says, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. So the day you receive Christ, you receive all of God in fullness. That is why the day you became born again and the life of God entered you, the Holy Ghost came. You see, the only way you can receive the Holy Ghost, you see, you can receive the life of God is through the Spirit. Because God is Spirit. His life cannot be physical. His life is spirit. So the life of God which you have received is a spiritual life. It's a life that came out of the spirit. And you know what? Let me tell you. The spirit is the medium. is the means by which God is processed into us. You see? God is God. And no man can experience God. Except through Christ Jesus. Now, how did you experience God through Christ? Did Jesus come down again to Nazareth and travel from Nazareth to Ghana? Talk to me. That he came to Africa from, 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 from Jerusalem. How did Jesus reach out unto us? By the dispensing of his life. That is why he became a life-giving spirit. And he said, the Lord is, is the spirit. So if you are talking about the spirit, you are also talking about the Lord. He is the spirit. And it's a word the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. So when you become born again, I say it. We all, by one spirit that we baptize into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one, and has many members, which body? Which body? The body of Christ, as the body is one, 
and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. He said, so also is Christ. So now he's making an like, like he's giving an explanation. So he, he spoke concerning your body. All right? He spoke concerning your body. The guy legs come quickly. So you look at the Alex. This is his body. All right? This is his body. Then he's saying that, let's read verse 12, all of us, one, two, go. So, pause. So, as this body is what? The body is one. Come closer. As this body is what? It's one. He said what? He said, this body has many members. So, what are the members of the body? Can you show us the members? The hand, all right? The fingers, the legs. Did you throw your leg? The legs, all right? Look, the eyes. <laughs> The nose, can you touch your nose yourself? Yes. The ear, all right? The limb, you see, many members, the intestines, oh la la. <laughs> you see, the kidneys and all the many parts. So you look at the body. If you are looking for kidney, you don't have to go elsewhere to find kidney. You can find kidney in his body. I show you are here. To, find, to look for lungs, you don't have to go anywhere else. There, there is lungs in his body. So the body is one, but the body has many members. He says, so is Christ. So Christ is one. Christ is not many. Christ is not divided. Christ is one. Now, every part of his body is Alex. So if right now we cut off his hand, we say the hand is what? Dickin Alex's hand. Now, you can name it Dickin Alex's hand that is separated because it's, it's removed. But soon it will lose life. It will lose life. But as long as it's in the body, it has life. You will not say, if you say Dick and Alex, Dick and Alex, please go. Now, Dick and Alex, please come. Now, when Dick and Alex was moving, all of Alex was moving. It's not like his leg was going and his, his head was waiting here. But he moved. The whole body, intestines, everything was, was, was going. This body has many members, but they are all one. So in this same light, you look at the body of Christ, the mystical body. It has many members, but we are one. Oh, hallelujah. The next time you do a, 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 a sage, remember you are doing yourself. You are not doing anybody. You are not doing anybody. Can you look at the brother, look at the brother and tell the fellow, I love you so much. Say it again, say it again. I love you so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can take us. All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body. He said, be many, are one body. He said, so also is Christ. Hallelujah. Now see verse 13. He said, for by one spirit, we were all baptized hey, into one body. By one spirit, all of us, we all were baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, <laughs> because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Answer me. Answer the scriptures now. Is it therefore not of the body? It's not of the body. It's still of the body. Alright? Look at verse 16. And if, and if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were in an eye, where would be the hearing? Hey! I'm glad I'm what I am. Oh, come on. I am glad I'm what I am. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. But he has set the body just as he pleased. So we see that the body of Christ is one. And the body has many members. We also see that the body is spiritual because Christ is a spirit. 
And if Christ is a spirit, his body is not physical. His body is first of all, or is essentially a spiritual body. And that is why to be a member of that body, you must be immersed. To be baptized is to be immersed into. So we all are immersed into that body by that spirit. Are you following? Good. All right. So now, how can we still experience the spiritual body? The mystical body which we are members of. Because right now when you are walking the out there on the streets, you don't know that you are a member of, of Christ. Or you may know, but you don't experience the reality of being a member of the body. You don't experience it. So how do you experience it? Through the physical meetings. Through the churches in various localities. That is why church meetings, that's why we don't say that we go to church. But I would say that we go for church meetings. Because you are the body of Christ as an individual, but also you are a member of that body. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Apostle Paul said, verse 2, to the church of God, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hate shall not prevail against it. He said, I will, I will build my church. Now, the concept of church is a matter that existed. All right? So if you are talking about the church, you are actually talking about um, those days, you are talking about a, spe- a special called out ones. Some group of people who were elites among the Romans or the Greeks. All right? They are the ecclesia. You see? Called out ones. Some special group of people who were called out. They are the church. But Jesus now said, I, he said, I, I will build my church. He changed the meaning from just some special elite to just a called out ones. Who were called out into, called out of this world into himself. So to be a member of the church, number one, it's not just to join a religious organization. It's not, not even just, it's not about joining a religious organization. It's about being a member of Christ's body. Be a partaker of Christ. Sharing with him in his life, in his nature, in his essence, and in all of his inheritance. That's the essential matter pertaining to you, being baptized into Christ's body. Are you sure you are following? Alright. So, see this. To the church of God which is at Corinth. Now, when he said to the church of God which is at Corinth, Apostle Paul is not trying to bring divisions. He is here referring to the physical church, the church that gathers in Corinth. So, for instance, if not for this whole denominational stuff that we have, we could write an, a, a letter, alright, if to the church in, in, in Ghana. But the church in Ghana is too broad. So you can go to the church in Latebi Okoshi or the church in, in, in Awush or Ablekuma. Now, if you talk about the church actually in Accra, you are talking about all the saints together in Accra. Are you sure you are here? If you talk about the church in Accra, you are talking about the entire saint that gather in Accra. It is within the gathering of the saints that we behold the church. When the saints come together like this, that is when you begin to behold the saints. That is one. Two, that is when you begin to enjoy the service of each member. So we all wake up. Okay, we are all members of Christ's body. Globally, we don't meet nothing. How do you enjoy love? How do you enjoy the giftings of the spirit? How are you raised? How are you equipped? How are you nurtured? It is just in the physical meetings. So he said to the church in Corinth, then look at it. To those who are sanctified in Christ, 
So he's explaining the church in Corinth who they are. Before someone thinks of some Greek elites. No. He said, these ones, they are the sanctified ones in Christ. Now, though this letter was written to the church in Corinth, you also share in the benefits of the epistles, the epistle written to the church in Corinth. Because we also are members of his body and can glean life from the letter that was written to the brethren in Corinth. And so it means that you also, to be a member of Christ's body, you are first of all a sanctified. So he said, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, he said, called to be saints. Hey! So the members of Christ's body, number one, they are the sanctified. And these sanctified ones, beloved of God, are called to be saints. Can you shout this? I'm a saint. I'm a saint. Say it better. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. So you are called to be saints. It means you are marked with holiness. Hallelujah. Called to be saints. He said, with all who in... Are you following? Watch. Called to be saints. He said, with all who in every place, including being too complex, who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. The grace to you and peace from God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. That you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. God is faithful. By who you were called Katos. Now wait. Go back to verse verse 2. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Huh? With all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both years and hours. Come back to verse um. Nine. God is faithful by whom you were called. So number one, you were called to be saints. But as saints, he said you were called into fellowship of his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. You were called unto the participation of the son Jesus Christ, our Lord. No one else said our fellowship is with the father. Our fellowship is not with angels. Our fellowship is not with this world. Our fellowship is with the Father. And it is by the faithfulness of God. Not by our self-effort. By God's faithfulness and by his finished work. Are we all called into his body? So we have fellowship with him. We share in what he shares. How? We were baptized by one spirit into one body. Are you sure you are here? Look at verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Number one. You know, sometimes some people say that, oh, the church globally cannot say the same things. It is an error. What Apostle Paul said, the church, we all must say the same thing. If you are all carrying the same Bible and we are all holistically looking into scriptures, not just from our own self-centered thinking, but from what the scriptures are speaking to us. We all must speak the same things. The same thing. The same thing. Thank you, Jesus. Look at it, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly, cattles, joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you, 
Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Answer. Oh, come on, I'm not feeling your answer. Answer me well. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Christ is not divided. And you know, Apostle Paul is bringing some interesting truth here. The only way people walk in the divisions of, of mind is basically when they look away from Christ. You see? They look away from Christ and their thinking is about themselves. What they want to gain. What they want to achieve. So their revelations are influenced by their feelings. By, by their thinking. That's why I said no interpretation of scripture is of, no scripture is of private interpretation. So if no scripture is of private interpretation and we all are equally in the same mind looking at scriptures as they are. Not putting our temperament, our imaginations, our thoughts, not forcing them into scriptures. And allowing Christ to be revealed through us. We'll function with the same mind. So you see that when he was speaking of we all, God is faithful. That has brought us into the fellowship of his son Jesus. Called us into fellowship of his son Jesus. You will see that there's a context. And in that context, he, spe- he began to talk about the divisions among the brethren. That there shouldn't be divisions among them. Why? Because God is faithful. That he has brought us into the fellowship of his son Jesus. So, because we are brought into the fellowship of his son Jesus, beloved of God, we refuse to be divided. We uphold each other in love. Oh, thank you, sweet Holy Ghost. Lido Dodos. Kada Daba Daba Babosh. Lega de de dosota pratash. Rebabaru Zunana Mata Pradesh. A member of Christ's body. So, through the meeting of the saints, gathering where the name of the Lord is called, is a where two or more are gathered in my name. In my name. So, the gathering must be in the name of the Lord. Now, what, what you see, you are a saint in Christ. When your response to gatherings are not gatherings in the name of the Lord, but gatherings pertaining to your self-centered needs. You are not functioning as a saint in Christ. The reason we gather more, like we are, the reason we are meeting like this, number one, is to maintain the testimony of the church. When we gather, we uphold the testimony of the church. Because when we fellowship with one another, we uphold this reality that we are one in Christ. We'll be talking about that maybe next week. That Apostle, Apostle, Apostle Paul, Jesus said, love one another. He said that the world will know that you are of me. And love is present in fellowship. So the fellowship we practice is a proof. That we are one. So we uphold the body. The more we gather together, the more we uphold the testimony 
of the body. Any teaching that makes you feel or think that I should be isolated, you know, I don't want to go for any church meeting. I want to be home to be catching my revelation. You should know that it is leading you away from the reality of your life in Christ. Listen, your usefulness in the body of Christ is not outside the body. Your usefulness in the body of Christ is in the body. The lungs has no use when it is outside my body. The usefulness of the lungs is in the body. The usefulness of the kidney is in the body. The usefulness of the leg is in the body. The moment the leg is taken off the body, the leg has no use. You have no idea. The things you do in the local church here, in the gathering here, it's is that which resounds in the corporate body. The growth of the body of Christ, the growth of the church is in your growth within this place. Your growth in this place is the proof that you are growing. The body, the body of Christ is growing. And your growth must not be in, in wrong doctrine. It must be only in Christ. And you know what? It is the lazy saint who gets tired when he's being taught doctrine. The teachings of Christ. Are you sure you are here? So anytime you begin to see, anytime you realize that you are finding it difficult to be with the brethren, you should know that the adversary is about to start something big with you. He's about to start something big with you. He's about to crash you, knock you out, if you don't awaken yourself to be with the saints consciously, intentionally, you will soon lose touch. You are no longer reminded of the virtues and the verities which are in Christ. You are no longer reminded of the, the essence of the gathering of the saints, the essence of loving one another in Christ. Soon, your mind is exposed to any nonsense. Because your mind is no longer now influenced by the truth in Christ. Have you noticed that the more you come for church meetings and your mind is focused on the essentiality of church meetings, you see that the more you want to be in church. And then you realize that the more you feel the need to be responsible. When you take that step to become responsible in the church, to handle duty, the more you realize that the beddings of the ministry grows in your heart. Actually, it's not just a bedding for the ministry you have joined. It's a bedding for the body of Christ. It's growing. So soon, you realize that you have so much desire to ensure that the work of God is done. But where did it start from? Oh, come for church meeting. You came for church meeting. You're hearing God's word. And you are participating. You see? Then you grow to be taking responsibility. Now, if not for the local church, how will you be taking responsibility? How will you be responsible in the body? How will you be responsible in the body? How will you be responsible? When Paul, or 
Yes, when, when Paul met Jesus and he experienced that lightning of truth where his heart was turned unto the Lord. The Lord didn't leave him in isolation. The Lord sent him to expect a brother. And he sent a brother to Paul. Are you following? Now, through that brother, Paul was now integrated into the church. If Paul was not integrated into the church, no matter his revelation, all he would do will not be counted in Christ. So he must identify himself with the church. And that is what, if we allow the current happenings in this world to influence how we respond to ministry and church meetings. This is one of the things that is going to happen. You, you, go, you, be, you will be astray. You will go astray. Because now, listen, when it comes to church meetings and you submit to authority, you are learning to submit to God. You are learning to be responsive. Listen, when you come into Christ, I'm really talking to you from my heart. When you come into Christ, you become born again by the obedience of faith. It is called the obedience of Christ. That obedience, you know what it is? It says that it says, believe in Jesus and you shall be saved. Now, when you believe in Jesus and you are saved, it is the obedience of faith. Then, as you have come into Christ and you have, you have experienced the obedience of faith, there is another obedience you must walk in. That obedience is often used as submission. So, Apostle Paul, you hear him say often that submit one to another. Obedience of the word. Obedience of the truth that you are receiving. Obedience of basic instructions. That's why Apostle Paul could still say, though, you know, we are not under the law, he still said, obey your parents. Have you seen it? He said, obey your parents. So, you receive the obedience of Christ by believing in Jesus. When you come into Christ, there is, there, there is a continuous responsibility to obey. This time around, it is not forceful because you have the ability to function right. You have the ability to obey. To take heed. To submit. Now, so this is what happens to you. The moment you begin to learn to submit to the instructions of the word of God. Because he said this, look at it. This is why we are not supposed to take things that affect our meetings, church meetings for granted. We must oppose those things. We must pray to deal with those things. Listen, nothing in this world could stop the early church from meeting. If the guardian of the saint of the saints is not essential, the early church will not make it a necessity to be meeting. So they had home meetings. They were meeting in their homes. Not just family. Home. No. People, they were meeting. The church, they, they didn't want churches to meet. It has always been, see, the gathering of the saints has always been the greatest threat to politics. To governments. Because when we gather, We turn worlds upside down. We turn systems. How does it begin? The more you listen to Apostle Benny, the more you begin to think in a particular light. I sure you are here. You see, the more you listen, the more you think according to a specific pattern. Your thinking pattern will not be according as the world wants you to think. Because... What, you, what is happening to you is that your thinking will be in scriptures. Now let's look at it. All scripture is given by inspiration. Give me the verse. Second Timothy. Good. Second Timothy 3.16. Let's go there. Hallelujah. Are you sure you are learning? Hallelujah. 
Shout this. I extend the fellowship of the saints. And I'm going to say it better. I extend the fellowship of the saints. You know, the more you begin to grow in the faith, the more you realize that it is not about starting a ministry. It is more of building up the body in love. Which means you recognize that your ministry actually is not starting a church. Starting a church is not a ministry. Planting a church is not a ministry. Your ministry, your ministry is what you do when the church meets. I'll be looking at that. It's all in this discussion. The wisdom of fellowship. We'll be talking, touching on all those things. So he said, look at it, verse 1. But notice that in in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I assure you are here. Good. Verse 10. Listen to what Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy. This is a young man that has come under his tutelage. A response to his authority. And is raising him in love and in faith. This is what he said to him. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance. So persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them, all the Lord delivered me. Say so yes, and all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He said, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. But you must continue in the things which you have learned. Oh, hallelujah. Which you have learned them. And that from childhood, you have known the holy scriptures. Which are able to make you wise for salvation. So through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So all scripture. So number one, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for number one, doctrine. What is doctrine? Teaching. Where do you experience teaching? Online. Online. You may experience, you may hear teaching, but don't worry. See what goes on. For reproof, for correction. Who is going to reprove you online? Who is going to correct you online? You know how you even participate in church meeting. But Apostle Paul says, when the saints meet, all things are done orderly. So, you know, a believer begins to grow disorderly because he's not with the saints. It is in the saints that your life is ordered. This is the wisdom of fellowship. Your growth, beloved of God, is not outside the saints. It's not when we are disentangled. It's not when we are scattered. No, it's when we gather in, in fours, in fives, in tens, in twenties, in hundreds. And it's not the ones in a week. You don't you see. It's not once in a week. That is why you must cherish the conference calls. You must cherish those meetings we are having. Those small meetings. Because in those meetings, you can be rebuked. You can be corrected. Like some of you, when you come to Zoom, you don't want to put on your video. I'm not There are some fine, you know, the, the environment will, it will be distracting. But there are some, you know, the environment is cool. You know, some of you, whilst you are praying, let's put your Zoom off. You know, your Zoom is on, you put your video off, you put your, 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 your sound, and then you sleep. <laughs> sleep for some time, uh, then you wake up and put your la ba la ka da ba da da ba So that the voice that comes, you know that, mm, is from the sleep. So disorderliness. So disorderliness. 
So that's what the world wants to ensure that the church begins to work in. There are some. We're not saying the situations coming up was because of that, but people take advantage of happenings to achieve their self-centered desires. There are long-term plans. They implement them when they get the opportunity. So you may say, oh, we are reaching more people when we do online. Oh, don't let it deceive you. Very soon they will tell you that you can't have your online service. By talking about Jesus. They tell you what to talk about. So we shouldn't just be excited about that. Be serious with the guardian of the saints. No matter what, even if 30 minutes, even if one hour, make time to be with the saints. And you know, when you make time to be with the saints, whoever is set over you, submit to that person. Do you know what it does to you? It helps you not to walk in lies. If you are a saint and nobody can walk up to you and say, this you are saying is wrong. This one. You must prove it from scripture. You've already, you're already gone. You're already gone. He said, all scripture. Did he say some? He said, all scripture (laughs) is given by inspiration of God. The output things of God. He said, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, to be thoroughly equipped for every good work is not just about doctrine. It's about reproof. It's about corrections. It's about instructions in righteousness. But when you think that it's just about doctrine, come on, Apostle, Paul, when you talk to me about how I'm, I'm justified. Hey, I talk about you being justified. Hey, glory. That's a word for me. But when I told this is wrong, even from the scriptures, the ones I read a scripture of someone, the person got angry. The person, I saw the person was angry. I've been reading the scriptures to a lot of people. People who behave like they, they, they can be angry anytime. No, they're angry. I said, no worry. I just opened the scripture. The Bible says, anger is in the bosom of fools. <laughs> For nothing. For nothing, then you are just, you are corrected, you are angry. You are not corrected, you are angry. Anger is in the bosom. The person got angry for facing the anger is in the bosom. But it's the Bible now. I said, if you don't like it, take it out of your Bible. Mm-hmm. And when people, when the scriptures are saying things that do, doesn't satisfy their self-centered desire, you know what they do? They begin to say that the scriptures are not complete. Hey, anybody that ever tells you the Bible is not complete, complete is the most disorderly person. When people want to walk in disorderly, they say the Bible is not complete because, you know, they cannot submit They are not ready to submit. Most people that say that, watch them. Most of them, they are often proud. That is not complete. Then other group, they say that the Bible was written by white men to be given to black men to take their gold from them. Such foolishness. That's foolishness. The Ethiopian Enoch who was reading the scriptures. Abi was coming from Argentina. His hometown is Argentina. <laughs> Those 3,000 saints that were saved, they were people from Africa, from different parts of the world who had gone to Jerusalem. They said they preach the gospel in every place, not some place. But they come and tell you that the Bible, we'll talk about those matters. And we will not spare anybody. See, when people want to push their heresies and error, they first of all must discredit the Bible. Because when you discredit the Bible, then you have the opportunity to say all your nonsense. Like some preachers say, Moses was confused. Okay. 
So Moses was confused when he was writing. But when Moses said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's why you believe. You believe that one. Yes, I've said that no man has ever seen God, but the son who is in the bosom of the father, he has expressed him. So Moses didn't have the full revelation of God. It doesn't mean that what Moses wrote is not, but he had, we are talking about experience. He did not experience. So if you look at the book of Peter, he said the things they wrote, they yearn for. You see, they wrote the things, but they did not understand. They did not walk in the reality of it. But we, when he said all scripture, he's speaking more even concerning all the Old Testament scriptures. Now, oh, you've never finished studying it. Don't want my copies. Apostle Paul dealt with those people. We'll, we'll come to those people. We'll talk about those matters. So that's what happens. They begin to discredit the importance of the seeds coming together. You see? So then, gradually, you know, you are being swayed off. Stick to God's word. The assembling of the brethren is the most beautiful thing. There is order only when saints meet. When you walk out of the saints, you expose yourself to disorderliness. It's only among the saints that you are checked and balanced. You know why I can't wake up to come and say anything anyhow? I know you go and read them. You go and study I was telling some of the brothers, I have first of all submitted myself to you. I see. The Bible says, submit one to another. So I listen. I pay attention. It's only in the saints. Our gathering is more. It's more. That's satisfying our ego. Our gathering is to uphold God's intention. When we practically experience that oneness of the body, loving one another, cherishing one another, upholding the God in you and the God in me, the Christ in me and the Christ in you, edifying one another, becoming the supply of strength to the other, provoking one another unto godliness, inspiring one another. Teaching one another. That's the church. That's the church. I forsake not the assembly. I cherish the fellowship of the brethren. I cherish the fellowship of the brethren. I don't give room for the adversary to have access. I am knitted to the brethren. Labor calls that. Anytime you realize you are walking away from the gathering of the saints to be alone. I want to be alone to do my Bible study and to cut revelation. No. There is something more beautiful about the church. More beautiful. It's not just Christ in you, but as we all together in Christ. We all together in Christ. I'm glad I'm born again. I'm glad I'm in the body of Christ. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I have one brother there, one brother here, one sister there. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, rise to your feet and begin to thank him. Thank him for the wisdom of